Well, we, we have a special evening. Our student minister, the man who has served us by overseeing our ministry to students for the past several years, Daniel Mollenkoff, is leaving us to go out and to be a part of a new church plant. The name of the church is Redeemer Community Church. Their first service is going to be November the 11th. And Daniel and Michelle and their family will be making their way to San Antonio, the Lord willing, October the 31st. We welcome tonight his family members who are here with him and also some of Michelle's family and some of the people who will be a part of that new church plant. We get so used to sort of an individualized Christian experience that's promoted in our country that we forget corporate identity. And tonight it's my privilege to simply represent the attitude and the will of the elder body as I share what I'm going to share tonight, and the elder body has the privilege to represent you. So that tonight I want you to recognize there's a sense in which the church as we ordain Daniel, as we send him and his family out to plant this new church, the church tonight has something to say to this man, and to his family. Now tonight I'm going to give from God's Word a charge, which is just to say some things that we ask Daniel to remember as he goes out to serve our Lord in the life of Christ's church. But you're witnesses to this. And so it's not just me saying, Daniel, remember these things, or the elder body saying, remember these things. It's the church at Founders that will say to Daniel through our prayers and our encouragement and our conversation in the years to come, remember these things. The Lord planted you here, Daniel, and that was for a reason. And now you go out from us, and there's a reason for that. And we want to be the Lord's instrument tonight to say, here are some things that we want you to remember. I want to ask you please to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We read verses 1 through 7. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Let's go to our God together in prayer and ask His blessing upon His Word. Father in heaven, we ask that You would strengthen me tonight, that I, Lord, might do a good job of presenting Your Word. I pray that You would be at work in and through me, that Your Word might go forth tonight in a way that pleases You in a way that would edify your church, in a way, Lord, that would minister to your people as a whole, but also specifically tonight, Lord, to Daniel, and that this might be a night that he will remember and take with him as he goes forth to serve you in this new church. Lord, we're excited about what you're doing. We give you thanks and praise, and we pray in advance for this new work, and we ask your great blessing upon it. Now, Lord, please teach us tonight. Open our minds and hearts to be able to receive well the seed that will be sown. 
May your spirit work in such a way that good fruit is the result of what we hear this evening. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastoral ministry is not for the faint of heart. It's not for the weak or the cowardly. It's not for the self-centered. It's not for the person who would compromise for the sake of self-preservation. It's not for those who would imagine that they will never be disappointed or ill-spoken of or mistreated or betrayed. Recently, I, I was listening to a question and answer session with John MacArthur, and here's now John, I think 73 years old, years and years and years of service, and the question was asked, what is the, what is the most difficult thing that you deal with in the ministry? And he said, still, after all of these years, the most disappointing thing, the most difficult thing is betrayal. And he said it was not on the part of the people so much as the betrayal that you experience on a leadership level from those that you've invested most in, from those that you've spent the most time with. So if you think you'll never be disappointed or ill-spoken of or mistreated or betrayed, don't enter the ministry. The ministry is not for those who imagine that they'll never be criticized or that you'll never deep, deeply disappoint yourself. Look at any servant of God, Old or New Testament, and you're going to see this is what belongs to the future of those who would dedicate their lives to vocational ministry. The ministry is not for those who think they'll see all of the fruit of their labor in this life. Church history is full of men who served well, faithful men, who never got to see the full impact of the effort that they put in during their lifetime. In fact, if you would for just a moment, look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I've thought about it often how Paul may have wondered about the success of his efforts in earthly terms. When we come to the end of his life, and here he is in a Roman prison, and notice what his circumstances looked like. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing in His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. I mean, this is His sort of last word to His Son in the faith, Timothy. Preach the Word, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchment. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. Listen to this, folks. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. Can you imagine? After all those years of ministry, all of those churches, all of those people, he is basically left alone at the end of his life. 
but he knows he's not alone. Verse 17, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. His everlasting future is not in doubt, but I wonder what he thought about the churches, what he thought about the people that he had invested in when here he is at the end and no one stands by him. So Daniel, I don't want you to think that the ministry will not have difficulties for you. It will. It will. But the ministry is also not for someone who can see no sunlight. The ministry is the greatest privilege. It represents the greatest treasure. For everyone whom the Lord has called, we would quickly say it is the most rewarding return on one's investment. The Lord's joy is your joy, that is, His church. The Lord's sheep are in your care as an under-shepherd. His sheep, His church, but you get to care for them. The Lord's bride is the focus of your work. You have the privilege and the responsibility to serve the chief shepherd who is their Lord and your Lord by watching for souls. So the ministry is all of this. It's courage and joy. It's sacrifice and enrichment. It's sorrow and song all at the same time. And no one is worthy of it. Never take this calling lightly. Never take it for granted. Never think yourself worthy of it. Never presume upon the privilege of it. Strive dependently to serve well and to serve well for the rest of your life. There are many passages that I could have brought a charge from tonight, but the one that I settled on is the one I would ask you to look back to, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, because it's a passage that focuses on the work of preaching. As 2 Timothy 4.1 said, preach the Word. This is where you begin. Daniel, outside of your personal relationship and devotion to Christ, this is where your work begins. This is the minister's marching order. This is our calling. And in these verses we've read, the Holy Spirit imparts to us a proper view of what that work will consist of and how we ought to carry it out. Everything that you'll do in the ministry, and there are many things that you'll be involved in in terms of work, everything you do in the ministry will flow out of this foundational thing of preaching the Word. In my own life, every bit of personal encouragement I give, every bit of counsel I give, every bit of affirmation or warning that I give as an under-shepherd, it all flows out of how do you handle the Word of God. And so there are five things I want to encourage you to always remember as you leave us, as you go out to preach the Word. First of all, in verse 1, I want to point out what we rest in. As you engage in the work of the ministry, here is what we rest in. Verse 1, Therefore, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. The end of the verse reminds us there may be times when we are tempted to lose heart. The word means to become weary, tired, discouraged, even to despair. And Paul says there's a good reason not to despair. There's a good reason not to be discouraged. In fact, in the light of this reason, he says they are not discouraged. Therefore, having this ministry, he says, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. What you rest in, what you must always remember, is the mercy of God. It is the mercy of God that explains Paul's conversion. I mean, he's not even a, a believer apart from God's mercy. It is the mercy of God that explains his calling. 
When Ananias was sent to Paul, he was sent to Paul with these words, but the Lord said to him, Go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. God says, I saved him. Jesus says, he's saved. He's a chosen instrument of mine, but he's been chosen to carry my name to the world. The mercy of God explains his conversion. The mercy of God explains his calling. And therefore, the mercy of God explains his confidence. We rest in the knowledge that we have experienced what we preach about. We preach about the mercy of God. We preach about salvation. And we are an object of the Lord's saving work. We know what it is to be brought from darkness to light. We know what it is to be brought from death to life. We know what it is to be brought from slavery to freedom. We know what it is to be brought from being a God-hater to being a worshiper. We have experienced this ourselves. And so we rest in the knowledge that what God has done in our life, He now calls us to share with others, to share with others about Christ, and that God will be at work as we do that in the lives of those who hear us just like He was at work in our lives. When we remember God's mercy, it rules out discouragement. When you're tempted to be discouraged, to lose heart, remember the reality of the mercy of God. That's how you received this ministry, God's mercy. Second, there are things not only to rest in, Daniel, there are some things that you must renounce as you go from us. There are some things you must renounce. Verse 2, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word. We've received God's mercy, and now this mercy calls us to a high standard. A right view of God's saving work, a right view of how God saves sinners, will rule out everything that would get in the way of that, everything that men would substitute for how God really works, you must renounce. You must be convinced that you can't do God's work your way. That God will have nothing to do with us doing something our way, in our own strength, in our own wisdom, even in sinful ways. He won't attach His name to it. So we have to strive for purity in the preaching of God's Word. That means there are things that we refuse to do. In general terms, verse 2, anything disgraceful, anything underhanded, that's how you can state it generally. This is what you must refuse to do. Anything that isn't, that doesn't represent integrity in terms of how you handle God's Word. No manipulation, no human cunning. In fact, he puts it in specific terms. He says, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word. Cunning, craftiness, some kind of human ingenuity that doesn't represent the simplicity and the honesty of the gospel. Swear it off. Don't engage in it. And no distortion, no twisting of the Scriptures, no cutting out portions of it, in the name of growing churches. Don't adulterate the Word of God. That's what it means. Don't adulterate it. Refuse to do away with the truth of Scripture. Don't use Scripture in a way that destroys what it is. It's truth. It's truth that confronts men. It's truth, even as we saw this morning, that exposes the life. Don't substitute your methods for God's method, and God's method is His message. This is how He does His work. 
And not only must you renounce these things just in a personal sort of way and say in your own heart, I'll never do that, but wherever you have authority, wherever you have charge, a charge that exists in the life of the church, you must take it as a personal responsibility that no one under your leadership will do that either. Renounce these things. Rest in the mercy of God. Renounce anything that doesn't really represent how God demonstrates His mercy. Third, Daniel, I want you to remember what you are called to do. He says in verse 2, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. God calls you to simply unleash His revelation. That's your job. To openly, simply, unashamedly, dependently state the truth of God's Word. Cut it straight. Say what the Bible says. Unleash God's revelation. And do it in such a way that if they remember you for anything, commend yourself to their conscience in this way, that you stood before them with an open Bible and you told them what it says. Let your life be commended to them in that way, that you have been called by God as a representative of His truth. You're a herald. You're a messenger. You're an ambassador. The church is the pillar and support of the truth, and you are a preacher of the truth. That's your calling. And in that way, you appeal both to sinners and to God's saints as someone who consistently, faithfully, tirelessly, as a, a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed, you work hard to simply put God's truth before people. And you do all of this remembering something, remembering God's presence. By open statement of the truth, verse 2, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Before you ever preach a sermon, remind yourself that you're really preaching for an audience of one. If at the end of the day, people pat you on the back and say you did a good job, but you haven't pleased the Lord, and you haven't preached that sermon with an awareness of the fact that you preach it in the sight of God, you failed. And if you're faithful to the Word of God and you've preached with dependency upon the Holy Spirit and you do it to please the Lord and you're aware that you preach in the sight of God and then they all walk out and hate you for it, you've done well. I'm not saying that's the thing you want. But I'm saying you've done well if that were to be the case. But listen, preach in such a way that not only you're aware that you do this in the sight of God, make the listener aware that he or she listens in the sight of God. God is present where His Word goes forth. This is what you do. Rest in the mercy of God. Renounce every underhanded, shameful, type of human manipulation and then unleash the revelation of God with clarity and carefulness and dependency upon the Spirit of God and you do it tirelessly, faithfully. This is your calling. And as you do that, fourth, remember what's going on as the Word is going out. Verse 3, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You preach Christ. You're setting before people a light. It is the light of the gospel. 
It is the light of good news, and this good news is the message of God's glory, and this glory is in the face of Jesus. You declare Christ as the glory of God. He is the image of God. And anyone who can see, sees His beauty and sees His glory and sees their need for Him. So that if someone doesn't see, as you're declaring this Christ, if someone doesn't see His beauty and is not attracted to Him and rejects this good news, what's going on? There's a veil. It's only in the case of those who are perishing. But in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. God is sovereign in salvation, but we have a real enemy. And he is at work against the preaching of God's Word. Don't ever forget there will be opposition, not and ultimately not from people, but from Satan himself and his kingdom. In other words, as we, as we have the privilege to preach the Word, God has given us insight into what's going on behind the scenes, what's going on under the surface, what's going on in the realm we can't see. Don't ever allow your mind to think that it's about you and people, and that's all there is. Have a spiritual view of your ministry. Understand what's happening so that you understand that your work is actually very simple. Just declare the glory of God in God's Son. Just set the light before people. Which leads to the last thing, fourth, fifth, remember where our trust is. Remember where our trust is. Who is going to save people? Who is going to edify those who are saved, as you go on preaching to the church, who will produce good things in the church? Verse 5, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. We're just servants. We just have the privilege of declaring the Lord, Jesus Christ. So that when God saves, what is happening? Verse 6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, creator God, sovereign God, the God who has all authority in heaven and earth, the God who brought everything out of nothing, brought it all into existence just with His Word. Let there be that God. How did He save us? He has shown in our hearts to give the light. That's how He saved us. He said, let there be light. And there was. Where? In your heart. And what was this light? What was this light that God imparted to your heart through the ministry of the Word of God? Christian, what did God do? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He allowed us to see Jesus for who He is. And the God who saved you that way is the same God who's saving others that way. You just preach Christ. You just hold up the light. And where God saves, He shines that light into a heart. And He gives knowledge, the true knowledge of His Son. So that your view of yourself throughout the rest of your ministry is one of weakness. Verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay. If my confidence was in me, I would quit. But my confidence is not in me. I'm just a clay jar. But there is a surpassing power. And that surpassing power, this is why God has chosen to use clay jars, to show something, to demonstrate something that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. I'm so grateful there's not a single person who will be in heaven who will be able to say they were my convert. If you're my convert, you're lost. If you're saved, give the Lord thanks. 
You are a demonstration of His power. The power doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. That means, Daniel, God can use someone even like me and someone even like you. You don't strive to be profound. You strive to be faithful. So this is our charge to you as an elder body tonight and as a church. Remember to rest in God's mercy. If you're tempted to be discouraged, remember God's mercy to you. That explains your conversion and your calling. Remember to renounce any kind of manipulation. If it seems for a while that that new little church isn't growing, if it seems like things aren't going well, don't be tempted to give in to something that doesn't represent integrity in the ministry. You remember to just keep on unleashing God's revelation with an open statement of truth. Commend yourself to everyone's conscience as, as someone who just has the book open, just a messenger of God. And let it be shown in your life, the way you live. Remember to be clear about what's happening, both in the case of the lost and the saved. Have a spiritual view of your ministry. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. He has the power necessary. He will build His church. Trust in Him. Church, if you agree with that, would you say amen? Amen.